uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is a project that we've done over the last couple years looking at about 100 years of shoreline change. Uh, and I'd like to start off by thanking my co-conspirators, Juliana Barrett from Sea Grant, as well as Bruce Hyde and Joel Stocker from Clear. And I'd extend an invitation to any one of them if at any point in time you feel like you want to interject or clarify or even correct me, most likely, please feel free to do so. So just some overall caveats. And by now, I think you know, the, the previous two presentations have done a pretty good job of framing what exactly is happening along our coastlines. And as you can, as you can imagine, trying to measure that kind of change can be somewhat tricky. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, what we're looking at is sort of a long-term picture of what's happening along Connecticut. You know, if we were to do this right now and design a process to, to monitor shoreline change, we would probably go about this in a very uh, specific way. Unfortunately, uh, we're at the liberty of using the best available information we have. Unfortunately, we have a very nice, dense amount of material, but it's not necessarily all consistent, and we have to make some assumptions and make some corrections along the way. So. Um, the two main points to keep in mind are shorelines are moving, and they're moving because of natural processes, but they're also moving because of what man has done to it. Nourished beaches, hardened structures, beach nourishment, and things like that. So we're looking at a big picture of this that incorporates all of those. To a very limited degree, we can sort of correct out or at least address in some way some of the man-made changes, and we'll see an example of that going on. Uh, so that's pretty much where we're at. For Why are we doing this? Um, so USGS has done a, a series of studies for the nation looking at shoreline change all along the coasts. Uh, and their work that's sort of done in our backyard looks at the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. And if you want to read it, it's a very good treatise. You can probably just Google USGS Northeast Shoreline and you'll be able to see the report. Unfortunately, what happens is it admits Connecticut. Um, and, and with good reason. Uh, they're looking at usually large-scale ocean-driven changes. Uh, as, as Long Island Sound is somewhat a protected estuary, as is the Chesapeake Bay, they sort of gloss over that. So there's, there's a gap in, in the coastline. And, and one of the things we wanted to try to do is plug that gap. Um, and USGS was actually very, very willing and able to sort of help guide us along the way. So a lot of the methodology that we used to do this is taken directly from what they've done in larger studies, and, and their help has been hugely helpful here. Um, so one is to sort of plug that gap. Two is to sort of update um, what was the most recent effort in Connecticut to do this, which was done in, in the early 80s, so it's getting a bit long in the tooth. Um, and also, there have just been general anecdotal discussions and estimations of what how much change has happened and that kind of thing. So what we wanted to do is try to provide at least sort of a standardized, quantified way that we can look at this unified across Connecticut. And hopefully we can use this not necessarily to make any firm or clear statements about what might be happening, but maybe to guide and at least sort of ask, help us ask the right questions about how to move forward. So one of the things that we, that we need to address sort of early on is try to get some kind of standard concept of shoreline. A lot of the data that we use comes from the same source, so that's somewhat standardized. Um, but it's not all the same. So for example, here, if we're looking at shoreline, one possible way is you could use the dune line. But for us, uh, we used sort of two main sources of data. And they, have, they treat shorelines somewhat differently. So it's a little bit important just to sort of understand what they're talking about. Uh, the largest source of data that we have available to us are, are NOAA T-sheets, topographic survey sheets. And these were done by uh, NOAA going back into the 1880s all the way up to present day. And essentially what they're trying to do is find what the mean high water line is. And for the vast majority of the sources of data that we're using, they're actually done by survey personnel out in the field estimating mean high shoreline. In talking with USGS, um, what they had recommended to us was getting as much shoreline information is better than getting less. And they've had great success in integrating some of the USGS shorelines with their data. Um, so if we look at shoreline that we get from your standard USGS topo sheet, uh, it's not exactly mean high water line. It's usually the wet dry line because they're interpreting where the water is on aerial photos in most cases. So while we can use these, 
we have to be very careful about how we adjust the level of certainty or uncertainty that we have with all of these. The, the software package that we use to do this essentially forces us to say, for any given shoreline, what's sort of an error bound? What's a plus or minus distance this might be in? The NOAA, sh the NOAA data has some very well-defined estimates given its vintage for what you can use. We sort of had to use um, some recommendations from USGS and sort of a personalized assessment of the data that we had to Connecticut to sort of derive those numbers. And we were sort of generous in that range of error that we gave, mostly to account for the fact that we're using sort of a different shoreline datum. So here's just a quick peek of what we have for Connecticut. As you can see, we have, we're very fortunate that the data goes back very, very far. Uh, and it's, it's fairly well distributed amongst <clears throat> all the decades that we have. This is not to say, I just want to be very clear about this, we don't have an entire shoreline of Connecticut at any of these individual points in time. In fact, I think the only statewide sets that exist are from the 1880s, the 1990s, and the 2000s. So those other dates have certain stretches of shoreline. So you might get an area where you've got lots of data, and you might have an area where there's not as much data. Um, but it's better than having nothing, and, and we're actually very fortunate to have something that's, that's at least as robust as this to start with. So here's just a couple examples of some of the information that we're working with. These are NOAA T-sheets. Um, their focus really was just sort of map the coastline. So as you'll notice, they don't go very far inland. But what they capture is quite detailed. So if we look in on <clears throat> this particular area, we can see that there's a shoreline defined there, as well as some other features. And if we take that shoreline and superimpose that on some more recent aerial photos, we can start seeing some differences. And some of the differences are quite striking. And you can look at that and measure it and get a, get a sense that, wow, that, that shoreline has migrated quite a bit. Um, in other areas, they're very close together. And while you might be able to measure a distance of change between one and the other, we need to be very careful about whether or not we're actually calling that some significant change. And we can address that by sort of using these error bounds that I had talked about previously. So it might be a little bit hard to see because the screen's dark, but there's some crosshatching around these lines. And in places where the crosshatching is separate, you know, we can, see, we can say something about how significant that change is. In other areas where they overlap, we kind of have to sort of be silent and not really say that there's something significant going on. So USGS was, was um, very kind to create some freely available software uh, that anybody with the information, the data that's out there, uh, and over the commercial over the self uh, software packages can use. It's called DSAS. And effectively what it lets you do is for all the shoreline data they have, <clears throat> You can set up some baselines from where you want to start measuring from and make some determinations about how many shoreline transects you want to run and it automatically generates transects and calculates distances and changes in statistics between all of them. So really the hardest part is, is getting and processing the data. Actually running the, the simulation is rather easy. And here are just some examples of the results. So what you're looking at is in this case here, it's just a simplified look at sort of the earliest and, and most recent shorelines and some of the transects we have. So this information is what we're using to generate some of the numbers and data that you'll see previous or next coming up next. So I think uh, Jennifer had a really nice slide that had some photos uh, that touched on the fact that Connecticut has a lot of different shorelines. Uh, and one of the recommendations from USGS was, once you've got all this data, you can start aggregating it and analyzing it in a lot of different ways. Uh, towns want to know what their own sort of average is, or you might look at counties, or you might look at the entire state. But to the extent possible, you should try to look at things that have some kind of geologic similarity. So that if you want to start looking at a trend for a particular area, some of the things that might be driving it are self-similar. Uh, and we're fortunate to have some uh, data that was done by Arthur Bloom in the late 60s, who I believe was from it was either Boston College or Boston University, I believe. This sort of segregated the shoreline up into different geological zones. So you'll see this show up in some of the analysis that come, that come next. What I'm going to do now is, is touch a little bit at a sort of very high level on the methodology 
and then highlight some of the ways that we can pre present that, that information. But effectively what we're looking at is sort of two main things. One is how much has the shoreline moved in any given location or across the state? And how fast has that moved? And we're actually somewhat fortunate because we have such a, a long time frame that we can look at this in two ways. We can look at the long term, which is going all the way back to the 1880s, uh, and then we can also look at the short term. And then we can look at the differences or similarities between those two and kind of get an idea of what might be happening. Are you know, things changing, getting worse, getting better, or what have you? Uh, so we have uh, tables of spatial data. We actually have the GIS data output, uh, and we have some summaries that are um, aggregated by different types, towns, geologic zones, etc. So in terms of how much shoreline has changed, what we're using at is the net shoreline movement. Uh, and this is an example taken from the, the DSAS manual. And what you see here, hopefully, there's a bunch of lines that represent shorelines at any given time. The net shoreline movement, though, is only looking at the oldest and the most recent and the difference between the two. So there might be eight or nine other shorelines in a given area. But when we're looking at net shoreline movement, it's only two of them, the oldest and the youngest. This is actually very good, though, because as long as you've got two shorelines, you can get data, which means we can do this for essentially all over the coast. And if you look at the time frame that spans those two points, then you have the endpoint rate. So these are, this is a really quick, easy way to look at two of the things that we're looking at. How much has it moved and how fast has it moved? So the good thing is we can, we, can, we can generate statistics and calculations on these two things essentially along the coast because we've got two shorelines in every place. We can be a little bit more robust in areas where we have lots of data. Uh, so the software allows us to basically do very, very high level simplified oversimplification uh, or regression al analysis. That lets us get a rate of change which incorporates multiple shorelines at any given time. The caveat here though is you need at least three. And in addition to that, um, the confidence assessment or that, those measures of uncertainty that I mentioned earlier, in some cases when the results come through might be greater than the rate of change that they're reporting back. And these are areas that we really can't say anything about in terms of statistic levels of change. So where we get information from this, it's very good and we're able to actually put a, a plus or minus bound on that. Unfortunately, it doesn't generate information at every given location. So that's sort of the, the drawback to this. So here are some examples of results, <clears throat> um, more or less to sort of frame the type of things that we can show, not necessarily that you can read and see all of this. But what we're showing right here is a statewide look broken up by our geologic zones and by towns of how shoreline has changed over the long term on a town by town average. So you can look at this and sort of get an idea of what's going, along, what's going on along the coast at a town and a zone level. And you'll notice in the middle of zones C and D, which is effectively New Haven Harbor-ish, there's some really big numbers. We'll get to that in a bit. So that was, the previous slide was the long term change that was looking at 1880s all the way to 2000. This is an example, it's the same data metric net shoreline movement, um, but this is just for the short term. So this is looking at about 1980 to present. And ideally what you could do is look at those two charts together and see, relatively speaking, A, how much has that changed? Or perhaps more interestingly, has the trend changed? Was there a long term positive movement that is now flipped and has turned negative or vice versa? And this is statewide, so nice easy summary here. We have a similar output that looks at the rate of change. So again, you won't be able to see all the numbers and things like this, but the same kind of concept statewide by towns and by zones. And this is looking at long-term rate of change and short-term rate of change, both in terms of endpoint rate and where possible by linear regression rate. And the neat thing is, is when you kind of look at this, if we were a little bit clearer, the general overall trend is the endpoint rate almost always falls within the plus or minus boundary of the linear regression rate. So there's pretty good correlation between those two metrics. So all the things that we saw before we're looking at statewide data. This is something that sort of windows in a little bit more specifically. This is looking at one particular geologic zone, uh, essentially the central beaches roughing from Madison area to it looks like 
Clinton or Westport. Uh, and what we're looking at now is net shoreline movement. And what we can do is sort of look going west to east and on whether that, that is positive above the line or negative below the line. And we've added some key locations along the way. So you can kind of see where things are, are gaining or losing as you go across this zone. And a comparable output for a rate. This is the linear regression rate. So same type of concept. We're looking at the same area. This is how fast things are moving. And you'll notice, hopefully, that there's not a continuous band of information. So there are gaps. And those gaps are where we really can't say anything about statistics rate of, statistical rate of change. We have to be silent on it. However, what we are seeing, if you were to look at that, depending on what the value is, we could say something like, you know, that rate of change is half a meter plus or minus 0.2 meters. And you could be, in our case, 86% certain that the real rate of change is somewhere in that zone. So we can be fairly specific in a lot of cases. We just can't say that all over the place. So getting back to New Haven Harbor, I had mentioned earlier on <clears throat> that we, in a very limited way, we could address some of the man-made change. Uh, and what we're looking at now is um, essentially the development that's happened uh, from the 1880s to, I believe, it says 2006, but most of that happened uh, around 1930, prior to 1930. So in cases like this, where we know that there has been severe and extreme development, we've gone through and sort of parsed out some of these transects. And we've ignored them when we've done our rate of change calculations. As you can imagine, numbers like this would greatly skew the values. We've left them in the net shoreline movement because it's important to know how much that shoreline has changed if you're doing land use planning. So we've got some very large numbers in terms of net shoreline movement, but we've sort of self-selected these out when we've done our rate calculations to keep them sort of more more or less unskewed if we could. And, la and here we're just showing a quick example of some of the, G the GIS output. Uh, we have um, data that shows net shoreline movement and rate of change. And depending on how you want to slice and dice this, you can make this look a lot of different ways. Here we've done arrows, plus or minus, to show whether it's accretion or erosion. And uh, different colored and sized dots to show the direction and the magnitude of net shoreline movement. So we can either look at statewide data in an, in an aggregate summary overview. We can look at smaller zones, or we can get right down to the nitty gritty and actually look at the transects and individual beaches and things like that. So there's different levels of data that we can use as we apply this. So wrapping up, um, I'm not going to read all this. This is fairly self-evident. But I think the, the big take home point message is, um, so we've done this. And there are other data, there's other data out there. Uh, it doesn't make what we've done right or invalidate or make bad anything that's come previous. But what's important is if any of this gets used, you really got to do a little bit of work and try to understand exactly what went into it, what the assumptions were, and what they're trying to get out of it. And then use that and understand that in making how you apply this in your decision making process. Generally speaking, planning level stuff is fine, right? You want to identify areas where there have been historic losses or increases or change. Um, look at it as a stepping stone to do further research. The one thing that we really can't use this for is to use any future predictions. So we might find an area that has shown two meters of loss over the last however many years. It would be inappropriate to say, well, it's going to be two meters going forward, not necessarily the case. Um, so we really can't do that. And we also can't, at least at this level, use this to specifically identify what caused that change. I would say that we could use this as a part of a future study that goes into that, but it would be inappropriate to look at this solely and say, okay, well this area is eroding and it's obviously because of all these groins or this area is accreting because there's a jetty over there. There are a lot of other factors that have may gone into what's caused that change that aren't reflected and can't be reflected in simply just looking at where the shorelines end up. Um, there's a website that I'm told is live now. It's been in development for a couple months. Uh, on that should be a, a synthesis of all the information I've, I've talked about here. 
There's also a, a hard copy report that you can download and read that goes into a little bit more detail. And if it's not there already, it will be soon, the actual data output. So anyone can download that. And if you've got GIS software, you can incorporate it and use it um, for your own analysis. I think that's it. That's it. That's all.